thank you all so much for being here. Uh, before we get started, I would just like to remind everyone to please silence your cell phones and close all laptops. To provide a little bit of a background, the Berkeley Forum is a nonpartisan student-run organization that hosts talks, debates, and panels for the Berkeley campus and community. Everything you see here, from marketing to student moderation to event photography and videography, is entirely student-run. And tonight, we're really honored to have Karen Diver speak here at the Berkeley Forum. Ms. Diver is currently the Director of Business Development and Native American Initiatives at the University of Arizona Rogers College of Law and uh, Udall Native American Native Nations Institute. And from 2007 to 2015, she was the chairwoman of the Fawn Duloc Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. Chippewa. And Chippewa, thank you. Um, and um, she was an appointee for uh, President Obama and served as the Special Assistant on Native American Affairs during the Obama administration. So without further ado, please welcome Ms. Karen Diver. Thanks for having me. Um, in terms of what I considered my best gig, um, it would be being Chairwoman of the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa because I ran a small sovereign nation. So that being said, I would like to recognize that um, I am a guest today on Ohlone lands, um, the traditional people of this area. Um, I pay respects to them, um, their ancestors, um, for having me here um, on their lands and uh, with my best wishes that um, they are able to get the recognition that they deserve and restoration of some of their homelands. Um, and, and they are welcome also to always come to my homelands. Um, in northern Minnesota, although, you know, it's really hard to get people to come to northern Minnesota. <laughs> it's glorious up there, folks. Um, yeah. Anyway, so, um, just a, a teeny bit more about the chairwoman thing, um, and then we'll talk about Obama a bit. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the way, don't be, I'm not dishing any dirt on my, on my man. Um, so, uh, the Pomelec Band of Lake Superior Chippewa is one of six Chippewa tribes in northern Minnesota. Um, there are currently 573 tribes. Um, my tribe would be considered medium, about 4,200 citizens. Our remaining land base, um, the outside borders, is about 100,000 acres of the Fond du Lac Reservation, although we only own about 38,000 of the lands within our borders due to government policy in the turn of the 19th century. Um, but over time, um, we've become a really strong government, um, and that was due to federal Indian policy um, that changed. So um, I'm going to kind of start backwards a little bit and give you a little framing of why do we talk about Native nations. You know, um, for a lot of folks that don't have contact with Indigenous um, folks in this country, um, we're kind of seen as relics of the past, you know, the cowboy and Indian era. and and that we were just kind of conquered, and you know we wore beads and feathers and rode horses, and um, so all of these kind of stereotypical historical images, and and not too much as contemporary folks and resilient folks and adaptable folks, um, and you know our presence here today is a large part of our resilience and our ability to survive. Um, frankly, colonial oppression um, that continues in many ways. Um, so, you know, there was distinct eras of federal Indian policy. You know, during the early part of colonization, it seemed like there was room for everybody. It was really just around, the first relationships were around trade. People coming here, the French, the English, they found Native tribes to be good trading partners and commerce. I mean, who knew indigenous folks here at the time had commerce. My tribe wears shells on their regalia, seawater shells on their traditional dress. How would you get those at the Great Lakes? Because we had trade routes. Hey, we have these awesome furs, you coastal people. You want some furs? We like them shells. How about those, right? Um, you know, so um, commerce was a part of what we did, and, and seasonality, and you know, it's funny that all of these old notions become new, right? You know, local eating and local sourcing, and um, you eat what's fresh during the season that it's it's due. And um, it took a lot of forethought. You know, you talk about you know family financial literacy. Well, for tribes back then, it was making sure you had enough food for the winter. 
and, and gathering at the right time and, and looking at sustaining you through changing climate, through journeys and travel, um, seeing your relatives far away. I mean, you know, if they think that you know, early explorers to the United States were brave, I mean, my people went across Lake Superior in birch bark canoes that we built ourselves, you know? Um, you know, it, but it, it's um, the narrative as kind of, um, you know, like these noble peoples like the, and or the savages, right? So you get like these really opposite ends and really dichotomous views of what historically indigenous folks were. As there was westward expansion um, under the doctrine of discovery, which was actually a religious doctrine, a papal bull that said that um, if any explorers from um, Europe, uh, Christian explorers, found lands that weren't occupied by Christians, that they could consider them savages and take their lands for their own. And the doctrine of discovery um, was actually a large cause of, to a, of a lot of colonization um, and subjugation of indigenous peoples all, uh, around the world. In fact, there's still today, um, you know, indigenous people calling on on Rome and um, the papacy to, to revoke that papal bull, and they still haven't said they're sorry and they won't do it. But you know, hope springs eternal, right? Um, but they see the errors of their way. Um, that genocide in the name of Christ should probably be a bad thing. Um, and uh, you know, just saying. Um, well, I mean, I mean, it sounds a little harsh when we actually call it what it is, right? Um, but it, that doesn't mean it's not the truth, um, and that there shouldn't be some reckoning um, for the bastardization of faith um, and, and the goodness that should come with being a faithful person. Anyway, so, um, you know, as more and more folks came to the United States and westward expansion was happening, treaty making was really around ceasing hostilities. Um, and tribal people really didn't have an understanding of a land ownership. They, they had what was called a use of property rights. Like, okay, this tribe, I'm going to use this area. That's your area over there. And we were like, cool, that's good. Sometimes there was little squabbles about it and friction and, and fighting. Um, but it was, it was the use of land. It wasn't the ownership because so much of what's located on land, and this is one thing that all the tribes have in common is, um, you're caretaking for your relatives. Um, the land, the water, um, those are our beings. Um, the animals that reside upon it are beings. Um, and you care for your relatives. And you don't take more than you need. You're grateful for what you have. And so when it was, you know, war making to start and, and the choice was your people would perish, you made treaties. Um, so they were under dur duress. Now, many of the terms of the treaties, and this is all relevant to later, um, the, the reason why the treaties um, were important to tribes is many of them put um, language into the treaties that said, we'll give up lands, um, but we want a piece of our remaining homelands. This became of the reservations. Um, but we retained the right to use, in a traditional manner, these larger areas. We want to hunt, fish, and gather on our traditional areas, even though our remaining homelands will be this piece, this reservation. Um, and those were what was called ceded territory rights um, that tribes have under treaties. So the rights to traditional ways of life, hunting, fishing, and gathering in these larger swaths of land outside of reservation borders. So for my tribe, the Fond du Lac Reservation is our remaining homelands, but we can actually hunt, fish, and gather in all of northeastern Minnesota. My tribe had five treaties going all the way over to Sault Ste. Marie. So we have reserved treaty rights over the entire U.S. shoreline of Lake Superior because we were a band of a larger people, the Chippewa, Lake Superior bands, right? Um, you know, but then, but then you ended up on these reservation communities and you would have a Bureau of Indian Affairs agent who was located in the Department of War um, who had to give you permission to leave. So they really were, um, I don't want to call them, I don't want to equate it with, um, they weren't concentration camps, but if you can't leave, 
Um, and they're bigger, right? Um, and they pretty much left you alone within the borders, although um, they would sell off your, your land and things like that to farmers and railroad and timber people and things like that. So anyway, um, the last treaties were signed in the 1870s or so. California never had any treaties by then. Uh, the Spanish had kind of done their job um, in terms of the missions, you know, um, who was that one guy, Juniper, 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 yeah, yeah, that guy, he was bad, um, real bad. Um, he killed all of them. <laughs> he, was, he could have been a military commander and not done a better job, right? Um, so um, between um, forced assimilation, um, and things like that, um, you know, there really isn't um, any big reservation communities here that have the old missions um, from, from that um, Catholicizing era. Um, so, the other interesting thing that happened, and I usually bring this one up when we talk about um, the current state of Native affairs. And I know this is state of Native nations, but you can't get today unless you get some of them pieces, okay? Um, the other, so the, the reservation era and the treaty era was huge. Um, now, I should preface the treaty area, um, I should have prefaced it by saying, this is what's a little different about American Indian folks. Um, you know, when you look at kind of, you know, the ro romantic Hollywood images, that's based on our race. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that the French and the English chose treaty making um, when they were resolving conflict and or imposing resolution of conflict on Native American tribes. Now under international law, how many pre-law people here? There's got to be one that always is. Yeah. Um, under international law, treaties can only be, ma be made between sovereigns, equal sovereigns. So the fact of the matter is, is you had these delegations coming and they recognized that they were dealing with governments, that there was autonomy between groups, that they had decision-making structures, that there was a way for them to pick who was in charge, and that, that those folks that were in charge, whatever the way it was, it could be a theocracy, it could be a democracy, it could be hereditary chieftainships, whatever, they had a form of governance where there was legitimate decision-making power that could compel the group to follow follow that decision making. So under international law, sovereigns make treaties with other sovereigns. That's political status. Now this is different for American Indian tribes than it is for many indigenous people around the world. Aboriginal folks in um, Australia, for example, they just conquer them, right? They don't have reservation communities, they don't have treaties. Um, they are very much using their indigeneity to make claims against the state, um, you know, for um, recognition of land rights, land title, um, and you know, overcoming inequities um, around colonization. But, tr but U.S. tribes, base tribes, had these treaties. <clears throat> so interestingly enough, you know, when you look at these romanticized notions, we have these really highly formed societies. You know, we had economy, we had political um, decision making, um, we were highly formed. Um, so that was really important to know. The second most impactful thing, although there are plenty, um, was um, in the mid 1800s when they instituted the boarding schools. Um, if we look at today's environment of removing migrant children from their parents, this is a tried and true method of subjugation of the U.S. government. Um, and it, it, they did it to Native American children. Um, the thought was that the, it was a military model. Um, if they removed children from the home and took them away to these boarding schools, they could remove them from their language, culture, and family traditions. Um, and then they would assimilate into the melting pot and the U.S. government would no longer have these obligations under the treaties. Um, and they did it in mass. And, um, a typical ta tactic would they would go into tribal communities and they would take uh, the leader's children's first um, as a way of getting the rest of the populace to kind of capitulate and not fight about taking your children because if they could take their children, how are we gonna fight it? And so um, 
There were some communities, um, 30 to 40 percent of their children were removed. Um, they also used kind of existing justice and child protection as, as time went on into the 1900 child protection systems, using poverty and tribal communities and things like that to remove children. Um, the official U.S. policy in the beginning was that children should be moved at least 60 miles away um, from their home community, and what would happen is, you know, these are territorial families. We have broad swaths of, of landscape that were traditional areas for us, so they just packed up and went to where their kids were and started camping around the schools. So then they changed the official policy to be at least 120 miles away. Um, in my own community, um, it was, it's still a memory in the early part of the century. An elder told me this, did you ever hear about the train? And she named this community, and I said, what? And she's like, they pulled this train in, and it was all decorated. And it looked festive, you know, like a party, right? Um, and she said they told the kids they were going to have a picnic, and, you know, we're natives, you know, we always have food everywhere. Um, we can put a meal like that for 50 people, right? And so um, you don't do anything without a meal. And so those kids were like, food, we're there, right? Um, and once the kids got on the train, they just pulled it away. And the parents were screaming, chasing it. My own dad got taken when he was six and his brother was five um, and sent to North Dakota and it was because his mom had tuberculosis. Now he had a dad. They didn't let him stay with his dad. So he was a first language speaker and so he lost his language because if he spoke his language he got beat. And he doesn't talk about it too much um, but he did say once um, that his little brother was a really kind of traumatized by the wet bed. He said, but it's okay. He said, I took care of it. I just told him I did it, so I get the beating instead. So what do we know about where children are vulnerable? That's where predators go. High rates of sex abuse, high rates of physical abuse. How do you grow up to be a decent human being with good self-worth and, and a sense of optimism um, about your life when you're told you're nothing but a dirty Indian and you're no good. And you quit, quit with your filthy ways and things like that. Now, what do you do when you talk about a community when that's 30% of every single generation? The last boarding school in the United States closed in the 1970s. So when people say to Native people, you need to get over it, what am I getting over? My dad? Oh no, I'm pissed. I'm pissed for him. I don't know where he found his resilience to be a good man, but I know that many of his generation self-anesthetized with alcohol. So now we come to the next you know, kind of stereotype. If we're not the romanticized Indian on the horse with the beads and the feather, then we're the drunk Indian. For the grace of God go I because we lose too many of our teenagers to suicide, the highest suicide rate of any other city. Mental health, how do you talk about post-traumatic stress? How do you talk about attachment disorders? How do you talk about all of those other diagnoses from the institutionalization of our children that happened generationally? They created perpetrators because that's what happened when you abuse children, they generally a lot of them become perpetrators, and a lot of them suffer from really deep and abiding mental health issues. And America's really bad about talking about mental health. We're selective about it, right? We like our heroes. Our heroes, we can talk about post-traumatic stress, but not about what our own government and systems have done to folks, right? So those were, the, those were the two kind of biggest things um, that impacted kind of federal Indian policy. We went through a period um, of Native peoples in the 50s, right before the Civil Rights Movement. The, it was when things were brewing in the South um, a bit, um, where we knew that a racial reckoning was going to come in this country. Um, there was starting to be organizing, and there was a huge political backlash at the federal level and um, how it impacted Native folks at the time. You know, a lot of, a lot of communities doubled down on all their Jim Crow stuff and things like that. 
Um, for Native people, it meant that the federal government um, would just de-recognize, because uh, you have to be federally recognized by the government to be considered a tribe. And that's the Ohlone people, that's what they're, they're dealing with right now is the federal government, it will not say that they are a tribe, even though they've been a continuous indigenous people in this region since time immemorial, right? I mean, Great White Father um, out in, in Washington to say that they have tribal recognition. Um, well, Congress stripped a bunch of tribes of their recognition, um, so those indigenous folks could no longer call themselves a member of that tribe. They would still do it, but they couldn't get any federal funding, any federal resources. If they had a school, it closed. If they had a clinic or a hospital, it closed. Um, they just took everything away from them. Um, and some of those have gained that recognition back over time. After the late 60s, early 70s, um, when the civil rights movement really started to work in terms of policy making and legislation at the federal level, um, one of the unintended beneficiaries, or intended in some ways, it gave an opportunity um, as we were starting to look at equity issues in federal policy making, whether it was Head Start programs and community action programs and all that anti-poverty work that we did at the federal level, tribal peoples were able to say, you know, well, what about us? What about us? Can we talk about our equities as well? We stand with our black brothers and sisters, but don't leave us out of this as well, because civil rights belong to us as well. And there was a whole slug of federal legislation that ended up uh, being passed um, that really sought to strength, strengthen um, and, and overcome some of the issues of what we call we term Indian country. Um, so um, some of this legislation was the Indian Child Welfare Act that said you could no longer use the foster care system to remove Native children from their communities and put them with white families. There was a huge market in the foster and adoptive market for Indian babies, um, you know, and, and using existing systems, like I said earlier. Um, but it was a Religious Freedom Act. Our, our religion wasn't um, legal until the 80s. Um, otherwise, it was uh, kind of subversive and, and underground until then our, and our ceremonies and things like that. Um, one of the big ones in the 70s um, was the ability of tribes to self-govern. Um, and what that said was that the um, American experiment of being the federal government down to tribes um, was a failure. And so um, tribes could, if they could prove they had the administrative capabilities, start running their own programs. So tribes started running natural resources programs and bringing in scientists and checking water quality and habitat for their, their traditional foods, you know, uh, restoration activities and overcoming some of those legacy pollutants from like extractive industries and things like that. Health programs, um, nutritionists, dentists, medical providers, um, average age of death in the um, 70s of a native person um, was 56 years old and tribes started taking over their own health programs and things like that. They started taking over their own schools and changing that narrative of educational systems being used as a form of oppression and actually using those as a font of um, cultural well-being as a source of strength. That you could be um, a truly indigenous person and learn your language and show your indigeneity and that that was a positive thing, not a negative. Um, and you could celebrate it and, and use that as a source of strength. And so tribal governments have been growing and growing and slowly just taking over everything the federal government used to do and doing it for way cheaper, because God forbid they give us the same amount of money it took for them to do it. Um, and buying back our homelands. Um, those reservation homelands are intact. Um, they gave pieces out to farmers and settlers within, so we lost even more of our lands. And, and tribes are using their resources to buy back and piece together those homelands. Um, so what does that mean for the current state of Native nations? We have huge issues around um, criminal justice. We have too many players. Um, Public Law 280 gives um, states jurisdiction in some states, but otherwise it's still feds. They don't come in and prosecute crimes, especially sex crimes. Um, we have um, 
a, a real crisis of missing and murdered indigenous women, uh, particularly in areas like the Bakken oil fields where there's those man camps and extractive uh, uh, industries and large numbers of transient um, populations, but just in general because those women are still vulnerable. Um, when people talk about historical trauma, um, we also need to say with Native communities that if the last generation that was abused that way was in the 70s, it's also current trauma. It's current trauma within our families, within our communities, and outside. Um, when I talked about about 80% of Native women in some communities, Seattle in particular, um, have been raped and sexually assaulted. Why would that be so high? Because they're still vulnerable to poverty, mental health, and chemical dependency. And predators prey on the weak. And when we do studies of homelessness and we ask Native women who experience homelessness, how many of you were coerced with sex in order to maintain any stability in your housing? 65% of them say yes. Because they're vulnerable. And sometimes you do what you need to do to take care of your children, right? Um, tribal governments have gotten stronger with the, the fractured um, kind of federal relationship. I, I was very lucky to work with Obama, who prioritized um, tribal communities. And even that wasn't perfect. Sometimes my advocacy within that building was loud and hard, you know? Um, because I'm still working against colonial structures who don't prioritize indigenous folks. And I feel constantly having to be a teacher and constantly having to push. You know, but it was somebody who believed so strongly in equity um, and that the system should work for all folks. But that doesn't mean that everybody who worked with them didn't have their own biases, right? So you don't always go to the top, right? You have to work through the layers, you know? Um, but the, the voice of tribal, tribal um, folks in consultation, where federal agencies aren't allowed to promulgate um, policies and regulations without doing due consultation. The UN uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People calls for free, prior, and informed consent, especially around land and resource-based um, decision-making. Um, that hasn't been fully ratified. Um, it has qualifications. At the U.S. level, we're one of the only Western countries, along with Canada, that hasn't. Um, actually, Canada did it, um, but they're just not following it. Um, yeah, I'm talking to you, Trudeau. Um, <laughs> um, free prior and informed consent. I mean, there's there's no wiggle room there. It's a yes no answer, right? Or it's um, a maybe but, right? And the buts matter. Um, and have to be dealt with on a policy level. Um, under this administration, everything's gone backwards. Um, we have done, under the Obama administration, an update to the Indian Child Welfare Act um, and did a judicial bench book with it um, so that we can update it from the set, first time since the 70s um, to help protect Indian children from out of home placement. Um, the Trump administration put a hold on it. We also compelled um, Department of Health and Human Services to compel states to keep start tracking. There's poor data about Indian country. There's poor data about our children, um, violence, our women, because we're statistically insignificant. Um, so we end up being other in data tables. Don't be that academic. That allows us to be an other. Real people. Um, how do you do policy making if you say white, black, Latino, Asian, other? You can't, you can't. Um, where there are communities of significance, you gotta drill down And So there's this movement amongst Indian country around indigenous data sovereignty. Aren't right, you starting to learn? Um, she just wants me to shut up. <laughs> really quick, really quick. Um, we're going backwards. We're going backwards around protection of, of um, indigenous lands, um, public lands in general, but it, Public lands are indigenous lands. It's where we do a lot of our hunting, fishing, and gathering. We're very concerned about environmental regulations, um, air and water quality rules, um, the protection of sacred sites, the reduction of Bears Ears Monument and Granite's Galante. Native American history is American history. Um, it belongs to all of us. It's something to be celebrated and preserved, um, not just those things you can put a building around or a plaque on, right? Um, we need to know where this land came from. It's a part of our relatives. So, um, you know, the state of Native nations is Native nations are strong, but we rely on a federal partner um, that will help us because we are still U.S. citizens.
tribal government shouldn't be the sole responsibility of taking care of their tribal citizens because I'm a, I'm a citizen of the state of Minnesota. I, I'm a citizen of uh, St. Louis County. Um, and those jurisdictions tend to abdicate their responsibility over um, the needs for tribal citizens to tribal governments. And, and while we're sovereign, um, everything is in negotiation with those other jurisdictions. So um, federal leadership matters. Um, their voice matters, their support matters. Um, but more and more, much like with um, our rather devolving federal leadership, right now our leaders are coming at the local and state level. And so tribes are really putting a lot of their efforts into those relationships um, and appealing to that shared citizenry um, of vein. Um, we've made inroads on the age of death, it's now 74. Um, our graduation rate's rising. We're still only up about an 8% baccalaureate rate, um, even less for higher um, masters or better. Um, but we have those pipelines. We've started tribal colleges. We're increasing that pipeline into higher ed. We now have means to provide scholarships with our own money. Not all tribes have gaming. Not all tribal people are wealthy. Um, there's very few that are located near major urban areas. Um, people say, why don't you share? Because they're a different country, literally. Canada doesn't help us out with our trillion dollar budget deficit or our uh, debt right now, right? Um, the fact is, matters they do help, it's just really nobody else's business. Um, we don't hold up checks in our philanthropy because it makes us feel good. It's more like slipping your brother an extra five bucks, right? Um, because we look at resources differently. Um, so things are getting better. And I'm sure I'll get to tell you a little bit more when you ask me a whole bunch of questions. Thank you so much. And start with that one. I would now like to invite up our student moderator for this evening, Avea Verwal. Glad to have you at the Glad to have you at the Berkeley Forum today, Ms. Steiber. So, in your, sure. Either is fine. in your speech, you talked about the forced assimilation of Native peoples by the United States in the 19th and 20th centuries, including your own family, specifically your father's experience with the boarding schools. What impact, if any, did this have on current forms of tribal self-government? So that's a really good question, but I'm for paying attention. So, I talk a little bit about tribes having their own forms of, of government pre-colonization. Um, for my tribe, we were hereditary chieftainships, male hereditary chieftainships. But you had this role for women as clan mothers. Very important, right? In the 1930s, the federal government actually imposed what they call the Indian Reorganization Act and said, unless you adopt this uh, form of governance that looks like we want it to look, we won't give you any resources. And it called for popular elections. It was actually a nonprofit model. Um, a lot of tribes, um, and most tribes did it, adopted these constitutions. That's the first place where the notion of blood quantum came up. These constitutions, most of them said you had to be one quarter native blood um, to be considered a citizen of your nation. Interestingly enough, that's the first time that our political status as a government was conflated with our racial status. Before that, it wasn't like that. And it's certainly not how we look at it. We were kinship societies. So if you would marry my daughter, which will never happen, um, <laughs> no, she's too old. Um, <laughs> what's your degree in? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, come on. Uh, so our sense of humor was a part of our resiliency, all right? Um, so I decided who my kin was as a Native woman. So if I found one of them French voyagers, it's like, oh, he's got a job, and he's not my cousin. Um, you know, I'm going to marry you, and he was a part of our community, and our children were a part of our community because the women decided, right? And so all of that cultural understanding of what community and kinship is got conflated with race um, after this Indian Reorganization Act. 
Now, interestingly enough, um, so it's a long-term genocidal strategy as well, because unless you intermarry, you're going to go extinct and not meet your citizenship criteria for racial. So when people say how when people say how much Indian are you, they just don't even understand how offensive that is, um, because that's the colonizer's um, definition of who should belong in our communities. I'm answering your question. I'm just gonna give you the background. A part of self-governance strategies of tribes right now is constitutional reform, and for many reasons. One is around citizenship and what comprises citizenship. Um, and identity. And the other part of it is um, how we you make governance structures that are culturally appropriate to who we are as indigenous folks. Um, so they're getting rid of those Western models of governance. Now some tribes have really adapted and that's a comfortable place right now, maybe except for the citizenship question. They may not be as um, prone to um, do some of that constitutional reform. Some of them that never really took hold and always felt like a really illegitimate way to represent and govern themselves. And so they're just throwing it out and starting from scratch. So you have 573 nations right now looking at how they govern. Is it culturally and, and is it culturally appropriate um, given who you are as an indigenous community? Um, does it meet your current day needs? Um, does it adequately protect your citizenry? Um, and it's a hard thing. It's nation building, right? It's, it's kind of like the fall of the Soviet Union or, or some of the other countries, you know, that um, are newly formed. You start at the beginning with your governing documents, and, and many tribes are doing that. Within this legal framework with the federal government, the United States and Native tribes have often faced disagreements over treaties that both groups have created with each other. How, if at all, do you hold the United States government accountable for past violations of those treaties? So it tends to be issue specific. Um, we haven't gotten anywhere with just you know, give us it all back, right? That's not going to happen. Um, but we can take pieces of it and say this specific thing is, is a treaty violation. You see it around um, water rights where upstream communities will take all of the water, or there's contamination upstream, um, so water quality, water quantity issues, um, degradation of resources, um, treaty and trust responsibility um, has served as well in terms of hunting, fishing, and gathering, and the ability to not only um, perform those activities, but how much of the resources should be available to us. Um, so in states like Minnesota, Wisconsin, um, we end up being co-managers with the state over fisheries and wildlife, and we are entitled to half of the allowable catch. Um, we are meticulous in tracking our half. Um, they are not, because they conflate what we would be food gathering with sportsmanship and economic development. And there's where the conflict lies. Fishing's a big industry. There's resorts, there's tackle, there's boats, there's fish houses in the winter, right? Um, and so they want to do it because it's good for business and it's a sport. We want to do it because it's good. So usually it's around those types of issues where we litigate. Um, so that's the upside to being self-governing, and that's the upside to tribes being engaged in economic activity, um, because we can, we can actually engage the courts, um, where we probably, in many cases, won. There are some federal district courts that tend to be more knowledgeable about Indian issues, um, and so tribes have to be very careful to not have conflicting decisions. Um, because not often just proper justices get asked about what their backgrounds are in Indian federal Indian law. Interestingly enough, Gorsuch has federal Indian law background, and he was the swing vote in one of the last Indian law cases around um, treaty um, reservation boundary or reservation boundaries case, where one jurisdiction said their boundary wasn't in this place, and they said yes, it was, and. And Gorsuch said yes, the, the tribes are correct.
so interesting. For the sake of time, this will be my final question before Sorry, we move into so <laughs> before we move into audience questions. All right. There's not a perfect answer. No worries. Uh, I wanted to end this section with where you ended your speech on the topic of intergenerational trauma amongst indigenous peoples. Given that, as you said, this intergenerational trauma exists continuing on to the present day, one possible solution that has been proposed is reparations. How do you define reparations and what role, if any, do you see it, see it having in healing Native communities? That's a hard one. Um, I can't tell you that I have a really firm answer on that one. Um, my tribe has gained the game. We're not wealthy, but it does give us some independent treasury to make some decisions um, and fill in gaps. We also do a per capita payment. It's small. It's $400 a month. And Generally, people around our community don't understand that you're getting something for nothing. Well, first of all, it's culturally competent for us. When one person had food back in the day, everybody ate. Somebody had a car, everybody got a ride, right? And so for us, it was really about trying to lift up our community. Maybe get them a reliable vehicle so that they don't lose work. Um, maybe help them buy a little better apartment or, or house and, and be able to have their their um, grandma living with them or something like that, right? Um, or bedrooms for all the kids. And it felt culturally appropriate, but we had no data. And then the super smart guy, um, an indigenous Hawaiian fellow, um, studied per capita payments over time and saw an impact on child well-being when you raise the income of a family, even marginally. Um, this is what you know, one of the presidential um, candidates is talking about guaranteed you know, minimal basic in income and, and for tribes per capita is it. And so maybe it is a way to look at um, overcoming um, some of those kind of generational problems that are kind of tough enough policy issues of just saying, let's guarantee a basic standard of living because when you remove some of those stressors from a family, um, it has other positive income or um, outcomes for that family. So I would say that money doesn't fix everything because we've also seen it bring harm into our community when it's too much. When people don't know how to handle it, behave responsibly um, for some of these communities that have a large amount of wealth, we're not used to dealing with it. We don't have a uh, background in it generally, although we're learning. Um, money doesn't fix everything. Um, one of the things that won't fix is racism. I mean, I might have a big, better basic standard of living to bring to my family or, or someone in my community. That doesn't mean my children or grandchildren are going to be treated any better in the border town, right? Um, in fact, that's, I'm not saying that we shouldn't do it because of that. I'm just saying it's not, it can't be the only thing we do. Um, but the conversation around it might be really good for our country right now to say why at a reparations meeting, what was the harm that was done, and start to build out a broader narrative of which that is a piece, and then you look at social justice issues in the proper context, as informed by a racially just society. Well, thank you for answering my questions. We'll now be moving into audience questions. If you have a question for Karen, please raise your hand. Just remember to speak up and be concise. Uh, yes, time. So one of the um, things that you mentioned was that indigenous tribes obviously have a lot of cultural variations. So when you were in your administrative role um, as the special assistant on Native American affairs, how did you straddle the line between having culturally specific resources and support for different indigenous tribes while also having there be some uniformity in your overall practice? I dealt with them as leaders of government and trusted that they could articulate what their needs were. Um, some were 
very specific to the tribe, like the Eastern Band of Cherokee wanted to be able to do traditional gathering in one of the park service areas. So that was particular to them. But it was a model for other park service areas um, to do interagency and intergovernmental cooperation around traditional gathering um, and park areas. Um, so I didn't really need to accommodate so much their individual cultural traditions. Um, there was plenty that we all had in common around restoration of homelands, environmental protections that were really universal. Um, that being said, it was more governmental differences that were hardship. For example, um, tribes in Alaska don't have reservations. They have corporation areas because of ANSCA. And the way that state was formed, they formed these indigenous um, corporations, you know, to funnel oil money through, and they kind of leave the villages on their own. So they're villages, um, and they have village councils. Um, but all of the kind of service delivery and a lot of the other stuff ends up happening through their corporations, and it causes them some tension. Once again, it, it's an imposed structure, right? And so one of the things we were doing through the Department of Interior was saying, do you want homelands? Do you want, do you want a reservation? Do you want like native title to areas? And the answer was yes. And we started doing that and then it, that got reversed. We one of the first things reversed under the current administration. The other one is Hawaiian. I mean they don't consider they don't want to be called a tribe. Uh, you know, they, they consider themselves um, occupied. They, they, they never surrendered, they never signed a treaty. The US sent military in there, and corporate interests, Dole and all of that, went in there. And so um, they deposed, uh, dethroned their, their queen, you know? And so they don't, you know, we said, do you want federal tribal recognition? And undertook this really long process of engaging um, indigenous Hawaiians to see if they wanted to be federally recognized so they could kind of get into the queue of some of the um, funding streams and they couldn't come to a decision. Some will not, they, they consider saying that they're federally recognized tribes as the last capitulation, and they're not gonna do it, some of them. So those are harder issues, because there still are indigenous folks, and we still have a duty, right? Um, colonization still happened, um, occupation still happened, so um, the ways that you have to deliver it might be different. And respectful of what they want. So those were, political status was more of an issue than cultural was, actually. Any other questions? Yes. Um, when you say gaming, what, what is that? Casinos. Okay, that's what I thought, I just wanted to make sure. Okay. Yes. Charlie? How do you believe the federal government should balance respecting Native American autonomy with also taking responsibility for the well-being of people in those regions? You know, that's a good question. So there's this thing called the Federal Trust Responsibility. And um, this was created out of the treaties because most of the treaty language where tribes ceded huge chunks of land, um, the language actually said, in return for us ceding this land, keeping our reservation homelands, reserving the right to hunt, fish, and gather in this broader land, you federal government agree to take care of our, our needs that create this well-being. And that's health, education, housing. It's all that basic needs stuff, right? And this was actually um, the Marshall Trilogy for the pre-law guy. Um, John Marshall, Chief Justice John Marshall, in the 1800s, there was these three seminal Indian law cases that defined this relationship of caregiving for tribal peoples in return for land. So it's been paid for, right? Tribal people think we paid for that. You're not giving us anything. Paid for it. Anyhow, John Marshall said that this is called the trust responsibility. And, and that was the obligation that the federal government committed to in writing, because treaties are the supreme law of the land, right? And so, but he to further defined it as almost like a ward status, like we're wards of the federal government. And so tribes continue to use that language around the trust responsibility, that that's an, because there's still, the land still is in ours, right? That there continues to be this obligation. That all being said, it's only because there is an equity, right? 
For me as a tribal leader, if I thought my people were well and had the same opportunity and, and the same equities and didn't have all this trauma and 200 years ago would I care about the federal government? No, just leave us alone. But until that point, um, until our people are well, um, then yeah, that obligation will be there. Thank you. Well, it looks like that's all the time we have for audience questions. I'm going to lurk a little bit if we get to ask a question out of the shop. We have time for one more. All right, if anybody has any, any questions. Now they're going to be all shy because they can go. <laughs> <laughs> just run it. So, you worked on with the Obama administration. You worked in. I actually, yeah, worked with Obama. Yeah, exactly. You worked um, in the social sector space. You worked in academia, and like you said, you like, literally led a nation. Uh, and we had corporate enterprises as a part. Half of my employees were. I managed twenty two hundred employees. Half were corporate, and half were. Um, government and service that we're Okay, so across all those four functions, I guess what were, um, what did you find to be most impactful in your ability to make, um, like to best represent the interests of Native nations and make the kind of impact you wanted to make? I would say that um, there were three things. One, I was proud of rebuilding our nation's homelands there was about 24,000 acres out of the 100,000 that were under tribal control. And then in my time as chairwoman, we got it up to 38,000 acres. Just very aggressive around um, land. Uh, then we had this contract dispute with a local city where I thought they were taking too much of our revenue. And it was a really complicated legal case. Um, and I was advocating for our people and, and thought that the deal was against the law, the Federal Indian Game Regulatory Act, and everybody just said we just possibly couldn't understand something that complex. And you know, for everybody around us, it's like, wait a minute, the Indians never win, right? And um, and we toasted them, just toasted them. And so we got out of that um, because you know now we're literate. Well, who knew? Um, and then the third one was we ratified the Kyoto Protocol. And um, we're now over 80% carbon neutral. Um, and got really aggressive around air and water quality and habitat restoration. Um, we're reintroducing elk and doing a lot of um, natural medicines and you know just the environmental work. Um, as someone who grew up off reservation in a major urban area, um, I still scream if I get a wood tick, um, but. Even if I don't want to go out there, um, the source of pride it's having in our community and that connection to our homelands is something that just really warms my heart. Well, I'd now like to invite our president, Tony Hogwarts, up to the stage for some closing remarks. Give him another round of applause. <laughs> At all of our events, we always design a custom poster for our speaker. Oh, so this is yours. Thank you. Oh, wait, okay. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs>